animals. Animals are in trouble all over the world. Our world is dominated by humans everywhere, on land, in, sea, in the seas, and in the air. No non-human animal escapes human domination. Much of the time, that domination inflicts wrongful injury on animals, whether through the barbarous cruelties of the factory meat industry, through the poaching of the game hunting, through habitat destruction, through pollution of the air or of the seas, or the neglect of the companion animal that people purport to love. Good day, everyone. My name is Wayne Modest, and I'd like to welcome you here. Today, I have the privilege of, and the pleasure of being in conversation with undoubtedly one of the most important philosophers of our time, Professor Martha C. Nussbaum. She's internationally renowned for her wide-ranging work in political philosophy, in feminist philosophy, and in the philosophy of the arts, and work around questions of law and justice. She has taught at a number of prestigious institutions, including Harvard, Brown, Oxford universities, and currently is the Ernst Freud Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics in Chicago appointed in the D Department of Philosophy and Law. Martha has published several books, including The Fragility of Goodness, 86, Cultivating Humanity, Creating Capabilities, The Politics of Emotion, or Political Emotion. For me, she is one of the leading thinkers about the question of justice. And today, we'll be speaking about her new book, Justice for Animals, or collective responsibility. This book has received many praises, and I don't have to get into them. You can buy the book yourself and read it on the back. There are a lot of them. But before I get into that, I just wanted to say why this was important for me and why I wanted to be in conversation with Professor Nussbaum. My own academic trajectory is somewhat otherwise. I am a cultural studies, cultural theory person who work actually in a museum. I am the director of the National Museum of World Cultures, the World Museum here, and what one would call ethnographic museums in Europe. For some time now, these museums have been in struggles to understand why they exist, what are their purposes. And a part of that has been around the question, for example, more recently, of um, restitution. But for a long time, the institution in which I worked, the Tropel Museum, was one that was wedded to the question of in, um, development cooperation. It was within that framework that I first engaged with Professor Nussbaum's book, thinking through development and the term that we often use, capacity building, which I found a difficult term, and trying to think through Professor Newsbaum's notion of capabilities and what that might do for an institution like ours. But as we struggle in my kind of museum today, one that is particularly anthropocentric in how it understands humanity, this book, this new book, and the work of Professor Newsbaum in general in our own questions of justice, attracted me to wanting to say yes to this interview. And to be honest, before I was invited, Professor Nussbaum, I wanted to invite you to the Netherlands to come to my museum, to sit with us for a little while, to, to solve our problems for us. But no pressure, we, we won't have to talk about that today. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I want to invite you to help me welcome Professor Martha Nussbaum. Well, thank you very, very much, very much. Really good to hear about what you're doing at your museum. And um, I, I'll see, you know, I teach all the time, so it's hard to travel, but love to talk further about what you can do. All right. Um, you, you do not know this yet, but there are a lot of onlookers here. We have a, a good host, and there will be a lot of questions. We will have um, 30 minutes of conversation around the book, and then we open up to the audience for questions. Now, um, I wanted to just open up with a little bit of joy around the book and your own joy to just ask a question, why this book? Why now? And perhaps to go a little further with how does this align to your earlier work or the trajectory of your intellectual work? 
Okay, thanks. Well, as you know from the books you mentioned, I've been developing this capabilities approach along with economist Amartya Sen for many years, starting in 1985, in fact. And I've focused on making a list of capabilities for a just society, which is something Amartya doesn't do. But of course, all of that was mainly focused on the human. And I long since have thought that it, the, the theory um, has implications for how we ought to treat animals. And so I've been talking to a group of people and especially to my own daughter, who was a lawyer for animal rights, and she worked particularly on the rights of wild animals. And so she and I started writing a series of articles together where she would supply the facts and I would supply the philosophy. And then unfortunately, in 2019, she died at the age of 47. She knew I was already working on this book and I had shown her some drafts of parts of it. But at her death, I, I really felt, well, the only thing I could do to go on in life was to take her cause further. I couldn't bring her back, but I could bring the things she cared about further out in the world. And so I really poured all my energy into this book and made it my, my kind of memorial cause to her. So that's how I got started. Well, I'd like to continue with that along that trend because in reading the book and in the opening to the book um, in, and also in the work that you're trying to do to honor your daughter, there is a way in which it, it feels more than just a work in philosophy. It also feels like a work in love, a work in care, a work in, 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 a, in, in engaging with a certain set of emotions. And so I wondered if you could... Um, use that as a starting point, a jumping point, to think through your, how does your ongoing or earlier work around the question of emotions tie into this particular project? And what might emotions, how might emotions be important as we think about justice for animals? Yeah, that, you're very perceptive when you mention that. Yeah, I long thought that for me, certain emotions were primary in directing me to the wrongs of animals. But I also thought that if readers were going to be turned to this cause and motivated to go out and do something in their world, then their emotions would have to be engaged with the way I wrote. Now, first of all, I talk about the emotion of wonder, because most emotions are very self-referential. We grieve for the people we know, the ones who are important in our lives, not for the people we don't know. But wonder is the one emotion that turns us outward, away from ourselves. And it get, gets us to say, wow, that's really important. And then, of course, that's often connected to wanting to honor and preserve the thing that inspires wonder. I think this is a very common way that we get involved with animals. We see an elephant caring for its young. We see a whale jumping in the air and we say, Wow, that's amazing. That's not just a thing that I can cut up on my plate. That's a being that inspires care. And so then after that, when we see that creature being impeded and wronged, then we have an, another emotion, which is compassion. We feel the same compassion for that animal as we would for a human who was being wronged. And then that leads to a further thing, now, we've got to be careful here because I think some kinds of anger are not productive. I think retributive anger is not productive. But there's a kind of anger that elsewhere I've called transition anger, which is a future-directed anger that says, let's turn to the future and say, this is outrageous. It had better not happen again. And I think that's really what I want to inspire, those three emotions. Wonder through my descriptions of the lives of animals, compassion, through the description of what's happening to them, and then a constructive kind of outrage that makes people want to say, this can't go on, this, things have to get, get better. Can I, can I, so I just, what, no, but I, 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 I just wanted to just make one, um, um, ask for one clarification, because while I was reading the book and, and, I, and I engaged with the first um, um, emotion, um, I was wondering what was the distinction between curiosity and wonder. In my museum, we have an invitation to curiosity. Is there a distinction between those two, two emotions? Well, I think they're closely related, but I think of wonder as much more emotional. Curiosity can be really intellectual. 
but Aristotle actually says, when we feel wonder at something, again, it piques our curiosity. We want to know how it works. But I think that mere curiosity is too intellectual, and it's not going to get us going. We could be curious about the lives of animals, but then we turn our attention to something else, and we forget about the animals. But if we have wonder, we say, wow, then our attention is held there, and we really want to investigate further. So then comes the curiosity. But that leads, that's, it's the wonder, I think, more than the curiosity that leads to compassion. So I think in a museum, you, you, of course, you always issue invitations to curiosity. But there are ways that you can do that that inspire wonder. I think a lot of the ways that animals have been shown in museums do not inspire wonder because they're shown as trophies, as skeletons, as taxidermy specimens. And of course, that doesn't inspire wonder. What inspires wonder is activity, agency, the whole form of life. And film can do that quite well. It's harder to do that in a museum. So I think that's a challenge for you. But in any case, I think you've got to have the wonder or you won't be led to the compassion and the anger. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I, I in, in, in the opening, you sketched um, five animals, um, the whale, the, the sow, the pig, the, the, um, the finch, the bird. Um, so you, you sketch animals that you um, use as the protagonist for thinking about um, your theory of justice and this new theory of justice. Um, perhaps you could introduce these animals to the audience a little. And then I wanted to ask you, um, just to push that a little further, are there animals for whom this theory might not work? Are we limited to only some animals and not other animals? For example, my wife works on rats, and nobody likes rats. Uh, can, can, is a rat also an animal that, that elicits this kind of um, um, compassion or wonder? Okay. I think it's easier with some animals than others. And I think it's easiest when we're able to see the animal doing its own thing without impediment. And that's true of, well, of course, all animals are impeded in some ways. But if you think about whales, we do harm to whales in manifold ways. But my story of how whale is an, a story of how you see whales leaping in the sun, singing their songs and, and being beautiful and mysterious. And of course, the other side of each story is to imagine that way brought to grief. In this case, I imagine how choked on plastic as often happens to whales in the sea. And plastic is very attractive to whales. They swallow it and they can't digest it. So it just sits there, calcifies, it turns into a plastic brick. And the whale dies of starvation. So that was the story of Hal the whale, named after Hal Whitehead, the great whale scientist. Uh, the story of Victoria the elephant. Uh, let's see. No, it was not Victoria. It was, um, well, anyway, the name, they're all named with D. Anyway, the, the elephant, I guess it was Victoria. V Virginia, she Virginia, Virginia. It's a wonderful creature. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Virginia is wonderful, and I think everyone finds elephants very appealing. So that's easy in a way, and then it's horrible and shocking when we think of an elephant hacked open, its face cut up to have the tusks and trunk taken away, and the young baby elephant snatched and kidnapped for use in a zoo. So that was the, the bad story of Virginia. And so the, you know, those are easy cases. Pigs, however, all the animals in the factory farm industry, it's harder to have that wow feeling because we typically encounter them in very reduced circumstances, treated as mere things. I mean, pigs usually are kept in crates just the size of their body where they can't even move or turn around. So in that case, I had to go to fiction. I think of P.G. Woodhouse who depicted a noble, wonderful pig, the Empress of Landings. And of course, there have been such pigs in the world, but not so many today in the era of factory farming. So I described the wonderful Empress of Landings, whose love, who associates with both humans and other farm animals, who loves to eat, who wins medals at agricultural shows. And then I imagine what would happen to her if she were on the pig farm in Iowa right now. And she would, of course, be in one of these terrible crates, 
She couldn't move. She would force to defecate where she sleeps, which pigs were very clean animals, don't like to do. She would not have any society of humans or other animals. So I try there to use fiction to inspire wonder. Well, you know, I don't use rats until later. I think it's a very interesting case because on the one hand, I do make an exception for self-defense and defense of others. So I think under certain circumstances, it would be permissible to kill rats who are posing a threat to life and limb. But because of that threat, people think that rats in general are disgusting. And they think that about most rodents, unfortunately. Rats, mice, squirrels, all, all rodents are highly intelligent. And so we ought to be able to summon up the wow reaction to these animals, but we don't. And that is a challenge, I think, for our, our political thought to try to describe their lives and their richness of those lives and the intelligence that they deploy. Because those that group, let's take both squirrels and rats, they're some of the most relentless survivors in the world. They can surmount almost any obstacle. And that inspires, I think, a kind of wonder. But of course, aside from the more purified rats that we see in the laboratory setting or in children's pets, Rats, most people find disgusting. So what we have to keep reminding people is what scientists know. And so I bring in a lot of scientific fact in the book, the, the way that squirrels can not only remember where they hid something for many, many months, but they also can think about what other squirrels are thinking. So they have this second order cognition. They can think about the thought of others because they have to be able to hide it where no other squirrel will find it and rats also have that. So I try to inspire wonder there through the detailed scientific description. So I think it's harder to make that work, but I think that should make us think that even though if we have to kill a rat in self-defense, it's might be permissible, it would be much better if we can find some other way to deal with the problems created by rats in our cities. And I think there's an obvious way that's already in use, which is contraception. If you can simply give a rat a contraceptive and eventually then the number goes down, that's much better than using poison. And it's better in lots of ways. It's not just more humane, but when rats are poisoned, the corpses lay around. And in my city recently, a beautiful bald eagle was killed by eating a poisoned rat because the poison is there for anyone to eat. So I think there are many reasons to use contraception for this kind of pest control and uh, so, so that's rats. Now, I have to say my own theory applies only to creatures who are, in the words of scientists, sentient. That is, who have an inner perspective on the world, <clears throat> who feel pain, who have some kind of inner subjectivity. Now, which animals that includes is an open question. So far, I think it's generally been concluded all vertebrates, many invertebrates, including cephalopods, the octopus, for example, the squid, and I mean, within the vertebrates, all bony fish have sentience. There are a lot of interesting experiments that I describe that show that. The dubious cases are insects where, yeah, I mean, there are some people who really think that bees, for example, have sentience, and many people who don't think that. Their crustaceans are, are in doubt. And finally, even the cartilaginous fish, sharks, are in doubt, simply because they bite off parts of their own bodies when those bodies are injured, and they don't show distress. So this indicates that they don't feel pain. So I'm just reading the scientists, and I'll wait for them to conclude about particular animals. But I think sentience is a theoretical dividing line in nature that's important, because it's when an animal as scientists often put it, when there's someone at home inside there, <clears throat> when they have their own perspective on the world, that it becomes incumbent on us to protect them. No, you, you, thank you for that. And I actually wanted to push further with the question of sentience, because as I was saying to you, that the, 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 there is a, a, a heavy, um, the book is heavily political philosophy, but it also reads um, beautifully. So it is, um, we have a saying in Dutch, I think that you say that it reads like a train, where you can just read it quickly because it reads so nicely. But on page 95, you say, justice about promoting the opportunity of each to flourish in accordance with the person's own choice. 
And I, I was, so you use the word flourishing and striving very, very often throughout the book as descriptions of the animals who, for whom you are, you are engaging with. And I, I just wanted to, to ask you about this idea of flourishing, which I find a very, very um, attractive idea to think about how we live in the world together, actually, not only with more than humans, but together as humans. So how do you think about, the, say a little bit more about flourishing for the, uh, the, the audience. Well, I think the emphasis is on activity, that we don't want to treat either humans or other animals as mere passive recipients of benefit. And, and I think utilitarianism, even though Peter Singer is a great philosopher and he's done a tremendous amount for animals, his theory, which focuses on just the state of pleasure or satisfaction, makes animals a little bit past my taste. I think we want to see them as trying as we do, to live full lives and then encountering many blocks along their way. And when we see them that way, then the success would be what I call flourishing, living well, doing lots of different activities in accordance with your choice. And so it's a notion, a rich notion of agency. And I think that's really important for humans because what public policy ought to promote is not just a passive state of being satisfied or well-fed, that's condescending. We want to promote people's agency. So even with hunger, as my collaborator, Amartya Sen, whose 90th birthday is next week, yay, uh, we <laughs> want to not just say, well, <laughs> give people some food. We, we don't want to just give food. We want to promote agency with respect to hunger. So he has always stressed giving people jobs which give them entitlements to food rather than just scattering some food around the place. That's one of the things he won his Nobel Prize for. Well, I think for animals, the same is true. You know, we want to promote agency. We want to promote rich living. And that means thinking not just about freedom from pain, but whether they have enough room to move around in. Of course, most zoos try hard not to inflict pain, but they don't give animals room to move in their characteristic way. So she, sociality. So most zoos have one or two animals in one cage, but animals are richly social creatures and often they need quite a large group. Dolphin needs a pod of 35 to 40 dolphins if it's going to live a flourishing life. Elephants usually need at least four matriarchs and then the group focused around those matriarchs. So these are the things we need to know in order to know what conditions possibly conduce to a flourishing life for that animal. There are some animals who do well in solitude. Certain birds are either they pair for life or like parrots, they can even be quite solitary. They mate occasionally, but they like to be alone. <laughs> so those are the things we need to know to know, for example, whether keeping an animal in a laboratory or keeping it in a kind of zoo is humane or inhumane. And I think, you know, we shouldn't therefore just focus on pain. It's fine to focus on pain, but we need to focus on a lot more. And this is what the notion of flourishing, which is a rich, plural, variegated notion brings out. Now, I, um, I like how you, you call it rich and plural. Um, I, I, before we go to the next, my next question, because my next question actually um, starts from, from your, your relationship between pain and flourishing. But, but before I do that, I just wanted to ask you, um, in your definition of flourishing in accordance to a person's choice, what would happen, whether or not it is within, for animals or for humans, what would happen when my flourishing is negating the flourishing of another? So when those two come into conflict, how do we, how do we think through that in terms of making choice for whose flourishing is more important? Of course, this happens all the time. And for this reason, I have a whole chapter on what I call tragic dilemmas, situations where it looks like we're going to be wronging somebody <laughs> no matter what we do. And I think here the philosopher Hegel had the key, which is we should try to think forward, think of a future where that conflict wouldn't exist and see if we can imagine that and then try to work toward it. For example, with medical experimentation, right now a lot of good for both humans and other animals is done by experiments using animals. Usually, you know, rats and mice, because we don't experiment on apes any longer. So what can we do? 
to stop that wrong? Well, we already know what we can do. We can work on computer simulation that does reaches the same result or maybe even a better result because experimenting on rats and mice is not terribly reliable for humans. And then no animals will be harmed as a result. So that kind of forward-looking thinking is what I would recommend. Now, in some cases, the conflict is very, very difficult. So think about elephants and humans in Africa. Elephants have less and less space. They're not more of them. They're not getting more, they're getting fewer. So they're not overpopulating, but the people are populating more and more because Africa is still has a pretty high population growth. And therefore you get these villages where the elephants, they need the protein from the bark on trees. They strip the trees and the villagers can't use them. So they're in, in endemic conflicts between humans and animals in that situation. Well, of course, then we have to think, what should we humans be doing to give the elephants enough space to live their lives? One thing will be the creation of large wildlife reserves, which the African countries have mainly done extremely well. Another thing will just be mediating in various ways. So there are whole groups, NGOs, that mediate between humans and animals in, in villages. But we have to use, in some cases, contraception. One Often it's human contraception, but in some cases, okay, give you, I'll give you a case. So when deer are becoming very numerous, it looks like they don't have enough to eat in various wooded areas of the United States. So what do we do? One theory says, oh, let the hunters go out and shoot the deer. Another theory says, well, not the hunters, but let's have wolves in the tear the deer limb from limb, which is a very painful death. I think the death by hunters is usually pretty painful too, because in the US, you can get a gun license when you're two years old in Wisconsin. So, you know, they're not likely to have a single bullet to the brain. But, I, you know, there, I think working well on animal contraception, using a kind of contraception, I mean, this has long been done for dogs and cats, because we don't want so many stray cats who have to be put down and so forth. And so just extending that to other animals such as deer and elks, because we don't want them to starve either. So, I mean, nature, in nature, they might just starve, but I think it's humane to use contraception instead. Now, we don't want to use contraception when it's just greed that's driving the engine. So in Wyoming, there are ranchers who say, oh, let's use contraception on the wild horses because we want more land for our cattle to graze. Now that's just their expansionism and their greed. Nothing inherently too numerous about the wild horse population. And so far the kinds of contraception that exist are not good for the life of the horses. So, you know, as with humans, we have to do better research. We needed years to get contraception that doesn't do harm to female women. And so, you know, we've got to work a lot on this, but I do recommend animal contraception in some cases. No, I, I thank you for that because, I mean, that chapter, it was chapter eight where you deal with the, tra the tragic conflicts, tragic dilemmas, actually was a good one for me to, to kind of escape the, the bind that you felt, I felt while reading. I was wondering, though, if we could move now to the core of the book, because uh, the core of the book, you are trying to develop a, a, a new kind of um, theory of justice, and, and that, that is um, spacious enough, capacious enough to include animals, so for us to think about animals. Can you just tell us a little bit about this new theory of justice that you're trying to, to, to put forward and, and how does it re relate to Rawls and our earlier theories um, or, or where, where do those fail? Or you describe, I think, three or four authors where you, you, you work with their thoughts in relationship to pain and flourishing. Where do those fail and where do your, does your theory, you think, open up the possibility for a new thinking justice differently? Well, I focus on three theories. There are, of course, others, but first is what I call the so like us approach. And this is an approach used by legal activists in the United States, the non-human rights project in particular, that tries to get courts to call certain animals persons on the grounds of their likeness to humans because they're so like us. And they typically focus on their ability to learn sign language or other things like that. 
great apes, and then they've recently added elephants to the list. Those should be given rights as persons under U.S. law. Well, the thing about that is they just picked arbitrarily a group, and nothing at all is offered for the animals that are doing the worst, namely the factory farm industry. And the people who created the theory don't mean that. They really want to help all animals. They just think, well, judges are not very advanced, so let's do what we can now and then work on the rest later. But I think it's a mistake to go down the wrong road at first because it reinforces a bad way of thinking, namely this way that there's a ladder in nature, humans are at the top right next to God, and then we have apes and other things that are closer to humans. But, you know, nature doesn't present a ladder. There's tremendous horizontal variety. And some animals have abilities that we don't have, and those are wonderful. So, for example, birds can navigate spatially much more effectively than we can because they have a sense that we lack, the sense of picking up on magnetic fields. We have another case where dolphins can navigate in their world by their capacity for echolocation, by reading what's inside an object they approach. And uh, actually, I, I illustrate this with a trainer in a dolphin facility who, whose captive dolphin told her that the trainer was pregnant. She had learned a signal for pregnancy when used to other dolphins, but she used it to the trainer. And the trainer at first thought, oh, well, she's mis misremembered the signal. But then she took the test and she was actually pregnant. So learning what's inside by your sensory reverberation that comes back from the object. And all over nature are many, many examples where animals are just different. And I think the right thing is each one has evolved for its own particular ecological niche. Each one has the abilities it needs to do well and flourish in that niche. And that's what we need to think about, not the idea of a ladder. So, so what I don't like about the so like us approach is it reinforces a bad old way of thinking. Next comes utilitarianism, and I've already talked about that. I think it's a great advance. I think that both Jeremy Bentham and Peter Singer were heroes for directing the attention to our similarity to animals in point of pain and suffering. But let's face it, it's not the only thing that matters. And sometimes pain is even useful in directing us to some harm. But, but the important thing I want to stress is that we, like other animals, and other animals like us, need other things. We need friendship, affiliation, interaction, room to move around in, enjoyment of our senses. So, in short, a lot of different opportunities to choose and act. So now briefly, I'll mention the Kantian theory. Rawls did not say anything useful about animals. He thought the justice just didn't apply to them. But one of his great students, Christine Korsgaard, wrote a wonderful book called Fellow Creatures, where she uses Kantian materials to describe a theory of animal rights, which of course Kant did not agree with. But what she does basically borrows so much from Aristotle which is my basic source, that she really comes up with a theory that's not very different from mine. But the difference is that she ranks the, our ability to deliberate so highly that she says in society, we have to be the active ones. Animals can only be what she calls passive cities, citizens. That means they receive benefits that we devise. Now, I think that's just not correct. After all, when you think about humans with cognitive disabilities, they are full and equal citizens under the law. And what they indicate about their welfare, of course, they have to have a lawyer, but I, if I were going to court, I would need a lawyer too, actually. I don't, you know, I don't actually have a law degree. So, you know, these citizens can't, they express what they want, not always verbally, and then someone else represents them under the law, but they are active. They're active because they indicate what they want. Why can't animals be treated the same way? And I follow other thinkers like Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson in saying animals are and should be citizens of the place where they live. Not meaning that they go vote or something, but meaning that their expressed preferences are taken into account when laws are made, that like children or people with disabilities, they can go to court, represented, of course, by a guardian, 
and seek rectification for wrongs that have been done to them. So that my theory then last, namely the capabilities approach. Now, what are capabilities? They're not just inner capacities. They're rather out there in the world, substantive opportunities for choice and action. So in the human world, I've made a template, a list or basis for constitution making that has some basic capabilities on it. My idea is that we do that for each kind of animal. We say, what are the entitlements that an animal has to a set of substantive opportunities for choice and action. And so we, of course, have to get to know a lot about each kind of animal. But surprisingly, there'll be a lot of overlap because let's face it, we're all animals together in a rather difficult world. And so there's a kind of general terrain of striving animality that can be captured at a very general level by mentioning things like life, health, bodily integrity, the use of the senses, the opportunity for choice, different types of affiliation, opportunities for play and leisure, and control over your material and political environment. So I think at the general level, there's a lot of commonality, but the particulars would, would be different in each case. Now, I, I have so many more questions, but I think I have to turn over to the audience. And so I, I have one last question that I'm going to hold. If there is time, I will ask it. Um, are there questions from the audience? There is someone walking around with a mic. There is a question at the back. And because we're on first name basis, just tell us who you are. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, ik ben Brechtje. Yeah. Um, my question is, what about inter-animal interactions? How um, far is our responsibility? Because you said being ripped apart by a wolf is very bad, but wolves love ripping things apart. Like, are we responsible there? So, inter- yeah, that, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. That's a, well, of course, first of all, there are many kinds of inter-animal relationships, which often would be would figure on the list. That is, dogs and cats can't describe the good life without talking about interactions with other species, specifically humans. But as for predation, which is what you're really asking about, yeah, I mean, of course, if the animal is living with us and is part of a kind of community with us, let's say a domestic cat, then I think it is good for us to give the animal a substitute activity so it doesn't go gobble up little birds. And most cat companions actually do that, uh, certainly, especially when the cat is an indoor cat. Now, that doesn't harm the cat if the person living with the cat provides sufficient substitute activities. Now, in the rest of nature, in theory, that might be possible, but it would be a mess if we tried to do it because we don't know enough about the ecosystem to provide the substitute activities. Tigers kept in zoos are treated like that. They're given substitute activities and they're given humanely killed meat to eat, but I think we should not try to do that out in the wild because I think it's just, we're gonna mess things up. I do think we're entitled to intervene in certain ways. Well, of course, all animal sanctuaries spray for parasites and tsetse flies and so on. So that's one kind of constant intervention. I think when an animal is wounded, let's say in a fight with another animal, but it's just left there and it's alive, it's legitimate to try to heal it or set the bone in a hospital and then release it back into its own group. And that is often done. But I also think that there's one thing that we, one step we can take in the direction of not glorying in predation, which right now we could take. Namely, if you've been on, anyone who's been on a wildlife safari knows that a lot of people who pay a lot of money for those safaris love blood and gore. And they pay out a lot of money to see animals tearing other animals limb from limb. It's like the Roman gladiatorial games, unfortunately. It's like the modern substitute for that. And I was shocked by this when I went on an eco safari in Botswana. And the people who run the, the safari camp, they set this up. They arrange that there will be so and so many wild dogs and so and so many elks or deer, I guess this kind of antelope, and that at 4 a.m. it will be possible to go out in the Jeep and see 
a pack of wild dogs ripping the antelope limb from limb. And they have to show that every day. So they have to really stage it. It really is like the Roman gladiatorial games. They have to have the numbers right. <clears throat> they have to kind of goad them on. This is what I call sado tourism. And I think we should not do that. We should try to minimize our impact on what goes on out there and not positively encourage the delight in animal blood. That doesn't take us very far in the world of predation, but it's at least something that it sends a signal that predation is not neutral, that the animal suffers and you should not be taking pleasure in this. <clears throat> I was pretty shocked when I saw that about two thirds of the people in my Jeep were there to take pleasure in blood. So anyway, you know, I think at the edges, we can push back against predation, but always with the full life of the animal in mind, so that wherever there is an activity that's taken away, that's characteristic and strongly desired, there should be a substitute activity, just like the scratching post for the cat, and, you know, just like sports for human beings. I'm in a country that values a particularly brutal kind of American football, which I think is the kind of substitute for a lot of combat among humans. So, you know, we would figured out how to have certain kinds of substitutes, maybe not very great ones, for human combat. And animals could be encouraged to do the same thing if we don't muck up their lives too much. We have the space for one more question, I think. Is there one more question? Oh, there's a question here at the front. Thank you. I wonder how a human could tell what an animal wants. And I wonder about the rectification for wrongs done to animals, for example, pigs, and how we could shape that. I think, you know, you and I, I mean, I'm not an expert. I think the people we trust to figure out what animals want are people who have lived with that kind of animal for years and with love and attention. I describe some of these people like Joyce Poole, who spent years of her life living with a group of elephants, a scientist named Barbara Smuts, who lived with baboons so much so that she had to behave really like a baboon. She had to learn what was acceptable in that society. And it was hard even to come back to human society. So, you know, we trust people like that because they have lived the life of the animal. They're not just mere observers. Now, some animals, of course, whales, you can't do that. So then we have to trust a knowledgeable scientist who has a good imagination and who watches a lot of whales for a long time. But anyway, I think that's the, those are the people we should trust. And then rectification, I, th I think the first thing is to stop the worst abuses. Stop the factory farming industry. Stop the pollution of the ocean by single-use plastic. And, okay, here's rectification. Clean up the plastic that's already out there because it isn't going away. It isn't decaying. So to prevent more whales from choking, we can start cleaning that up. So there are many things that we can do moving toward rectification. But thank you very much. You know, I'd um, as, we, as we end, I, I actually had one question which won't be a question because as I read the book, I struggled um, with, with one thing. I struggled with um, the idea, because I work on questions of colonialism and slavery, and I work around the question of, sometimes in question of um, gender and sexuality, I, I, I struggled with what it means when we think of interspecies of more than human when our models for justice have not been adequate to gain justice for all humans yet. And is it so that to push this um, would distract us from creating that? But as I read the book, I actually thought that it opens up a capacious space, not for competition, but rather for thinking justice otherwise. So it also opens up the possibility for thinking about humans. So in that sense, I, I want to celebrate by reading the end. You say, but I hope that the intervening chapters have helped to awaken or strengthen the three emotions I, I discussed in the first chapter, wonder, at the complexity and diversity of animal lives, compassion for what all too often befalls those lives of our human-dominated world, and a productive future-generated, um, future-directive outrage. As I read the book, 
I was enthralled with wonder, with emotions, and actually with an urgency to try and do something otherwise. So I want us all to celebrate with Martha today, just to say thanks. And I will do the marketing for her and say, go and buy the book. <laughs> Why? Why is that you? All right. Go ahead, say, say this again, Martha. I just said, I really want to thank you for this wonderful interview, which was so perceptive and really got to the heart of a lot of what I was trying to do. So I really appreciate that, and I appreciate the audience, too. All right, thank you. And Martha has to leave immediately, so we say bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>